Okay. Um, we have a guy called Lyndon. Let's give, I'll give him a key when he comes. Okay. All right. Thanks. Bye bye. <laughs> okay, let's start on again. Yeah, good to go. Good to go. Okay, so we come to now the taxation consequences of a company. We see that the, you, the thing that we have is a separate legal entity that contains the risk that if the company goes bust, you have limited liability, you don't go broke with it. Is that true? No, because normally if you have got finance for a company and you are the shareholder or director, you will have signed security for the company's debts. So you will go down with it. That is one of the big problems with business rescue, is that the banks, when they have given finance to a company, they're not stupid, they know about limited liability, so they make the shareholder sign security for the debt. And they say, well, if you go into business debt rescue, we will claim from you when you come out. You will go insolvent with it, okay? You've got theoretically more access to capital because you're formalized. You have continuity, you hope, because you've got fellow shareholders and the company carries on even though you have died. And you have a flat rate of tax of 28%, which is lower than the top marginal rate of tax of 45%. Then, the disadvantage are now we have to start complying. Now, we didn't do much yesterday on the governance of small companies. All that stuff was big listed companies and all the rest of it. A small company is doing pretty well if it can just keep itself legal and comply with all the requirements of the Companies Act and the Tax Act. That's a good starting point before we get too clever about all the other stuff in King 4. There is a short-term version of King 4. If somebody's looking to write a good essay as an essay topic for your um, submission, look at the governance of small companies. If you're interested, that might be something to look at. But super regulation and monitoring comes into it. And the responsibility of Section 76 of the Companies Act if you do something stupid with a company, let's say, give an example here, you may create a pollution threat or an envi do environmental damage. The test of the reasonable person in terms of Section 76 still applies, even if you are a small company, which means that you can be personally on the hook for it. And also look at this, please, in tax, it's a very important thing. Can SARS go for the directors of a company if the tax is not paid over? Directors and shareholders. You will see later today, yes, in some taxes, particularly VAT and PAYE. SARS can put people in jail and has. Whenever you see these big cases of SARS going for directors, it is for unpaid PAYE and VAT. Now just understand the relationship. You collect VAT from your customers. You collect PAYE from your staff that has to be paid over. You are government's agent for doing that, unpaid. <coughs> but if you fuck up, it is theft. You haven't handed over somebody else's money. You are in an agency capacity. So, and when you see this over and over again, you see, particularly in the Eastern Cape, lots of these cases with people going to jail for tax evasion. It's not because they've crooked their personal tax return. It is because they haven't paid over PAYE and VAT. 
Now, if you take it on Julius Malema's tax fraud case, we'll come back to that later. Okay. But the reason that he didn't go to jail was it was not a PAYE and VAT matter. It was a tax matter only. They couldn't bring a theft charge. If that had been PAYE and VAT, it might have had a completely different outcome. Moral to the story, if you are ever in a company, you make sure that your PAYE, UIF, SDL and all of that is paid on the date that it is due. You never ever borrow the receiver of revenues money. It, it, rather go insolvent. But you pay the receiver, the, you pay SARS. Right, we've done the effective rates of tax. Okay, we've had a long discussion about it. Now, although we have three types of taxpayer, we now have to start measuring taxable income. The tax rates that we have looked at so far are the rates that are applied on your profit. In tax, profit doesn't appear. It is called taxable income. Taxable income equals profit. And you can put it this way, that SARS doesn't trust accounting. Okay, so they have their own definition of how you come to measure profit in tax. That is called taxable income is what you pay profit on, the tax on. And it is outlined in a formula which applies to all taxpayers. So although there are three types of taxpayers, there is one formula to get to the income that you pay tax on. And that's applied to everybody. And the formula works like this. You find your gross income, your revenue stream. You take out of it your exempt income. Then you get, that leaves you with what's called income. You then take off your revenue expenditure, which is your operating expenses. You then get your special allowances, okay, <coughs> which are for your capital assets, your big assets, your that's your, if you want your depreciation. That leads you to the idea of taxable income to which you apply the tax table. That applies to everybody. Now, what happens is that when you come to the personal taxpayer, we say the gross income is what you earn. They have been very cleverly eliminating all the allowances. You can't claim them on your tax return. So when it comes to the employed individual, if you earned it, you pay tax on it. That's it. When you come to the individual that trades, okay, that you have a tr trading income, then these allowances open up to you. Now this is incredibly important in future career choices. Because if you are employed, understand there's basically nothing you can do about your tax except your retirement funds. I'll illustrate it to you this way. If I sit in an office at Rhodes and receive a salary, straightforward. There's your income, pay tax on it. There's pension. The only deduction there would be pension and medical. But I don't do that, I trade. So I get these allowances. So, that camera. Person who's trading in an office now wants to get into e-learning and because the university hasn't got his own money to buy his own camera, can he claim a tax deduction? No. I'm trading, I can. Okay. Do you see the difference? So there is an advantage to trading. Now, what is the gross income of the taxpayer? So what we're doing now is we are looking at starting point. Right up the top there. How much income? Now what they try to do now, and the, the accountants spend years on this. What is gross income? So we go then into Section 1 of the Income Tax Act. Always Section 1 of an Act gives you the definitions of the Act. And it says, In the case of any resident, the total amount in cash or otherwise received or accrued or in favour of such person. 
Now, you have to break, we then in a tax course spend a term on that line. Analyzing it to death as to what is taxable and what is not. Okay? But then comes a very interesting second provisio in the person who is other than a resident. It's not only people who live in South Africa who pay tax. If you don't live here and you have income of a South African source made in South Africa, even though you don't live here, you still pay tax on that income. That is what's called the second provisio. Okay? And then there are a lot of sub provisios which exclude certain types of income. For example, capital income is excluded and then brought back with another definition. So now we start. Welcome to the wonderful world of tax. Okay, so there it is. Who is a resident? And as cheap as this can get fun. Okay. You are all resident taxpayers, right? You live here. So, what it says is, in the, a resident in the con co uh, context of a South African is any person ordinarily resident in the Republic. Ordinarily resident in the Republic means that this is the place to which you return from your wanderings. It's where you keep your dog, your washing machine and your spouse. Okay? So my place to, when I've done my business and I've finished running, my place of residence is Kentmansey. That's where I go back to. But then there are people who don't know where the fuck they live. They've got houses all over the world. And this is where it becomes fascinating. Is that if you've got no answer to that question, then you have a fallback provision which talks about the number of days that you spend in the country. And if you exceed that number of days, you don't become a naturalized citizen <coughs> of the country, you become a taxpayer of the country. Now this leads to serious shit. Okay? The biggest example of this that you see is in sports management. International sportsmen, they move all over the world. Is Ernie L. South African? As South African is built on, right? Is he a South African resident taxpayer? No. <coughs> Ernie L. lives in Wentworth, United Kingdom, on a golf course there. He chooses to pay tax on, in the, on his worldwide income in the United Kingdom. And he makes damn sure that he doesn't exceed the days test. He will never spend more than 91 days a year in South Africa. He'll come out here in December and play a couple of tournaments and bugger off. So even though he is a South African as Biltong, he is not an ordinarily resident taxpayer. Now, you can, if you see what this does to the rock stars and the golfers, and the Formula One drivers. Where do the Formula One drivers live? Most of them. The Principality of Monaco. It's been traditional for them to stay there. What is, if you live in that couple of square miles of the Principality of Monaco, in a little box, you don't pay tax. But you pay for the privilege of the little box an enormous amount of money. So people go and plonk themselves where there is a low rate of tax. So theoretically, I can go and say, I don't want to pay tax in South Africa. I'm going to take 10 million rand and buy myself a house in Mauritius. Right? And I will visit South Africa from time to time to give a few lectures. That makes me not ordinarily resident, provided I keep out of the country for more than, for, less, for more than 91 days a year. 
There are some exceptions on the 915 day rule and all the rest of it, but the, you can do that. Now this causes all sorts of shit. Because you have similar provisions with this all over the world. The most famous example of this was Keith Richards. Anybody know who Keith Richards is? Lead guitarist of the Rolling Stones. And they were doing a concerts in the UK and they suddenly realized that if Keith Richards played at that concert tonight, he would exceed the day's present rule and he would therefore become taxable in the UK. So guess what happened? Cancelled. Okay. You saw it um, sting in the police. They're trying to get ready now for their world tour. Where do they, they, he sends his other band members a message. We are meeting in Canada. Now this, they've always been fighting with each other, that lot, Copeland and all the rest of it. He says, fuck you, I don't want to go to Canada. He says, we're meeting there because I'm not practicing in the US, I'll become a taxpayer there. Because by the day's present. And this has always been a problem. Rolling Stones, again, they are the classics on it. They're, one of their most famous albums is Exile on Main Street. Okay? Recorded in France. They their tax liability in the UK became so horrendous and so out of control managed that they all went and they got this huge villa on the Mediterranean coast in France. And we're going to live here as a band forever in France and tour the world from here to get away from our tax liabilities in the UK. What happened? It lasted one summer. <coughs> and they all got so bored and missed the UK so much. And there were so many problems that they all, after the summer, the whole thing collapsed and they all went their different ways. But there was one album to show for it. It's an amazing story. Boris Becker, international tennis guy, lives in Monaco, right? Now, Boris Becker's never been at the deep end of the gene pool when it comes to brains. Balls is one thing with, but brains is a different thing. And he, unbeknown to himself, spent an extra night with his, at his sister's house in Germany. Extraordinary part of Germany in the whole uh, post-world period is that a lot of the ex-Gestapo shits landed up in their revenue collection function. And they have incredibly um, aggressive tax authority. And they tracked this down and they, they found out, Boris, you spent an extra day. We are not, we're going to put you in jail for tax evasion because you haven't declared that you are a German resident taxpayer. And he became within a hair's breadth of going to jail. There was a plea bargain at the last minute to keep him out of jail on the day's present test. But what is interesting in this, and you know, this is the wonderful world that I live in, um, is that we have this provision here. You ask, do you ordinarily live here? Okay, if so, you are a resident. If not, we have tests for individuals. Those are the day's present tests. Now that leads to all sorts of anomalies. Okay. Does a foreign national pay tax in South Africa? Yes, if he is present through the day's present test. Even if he hasn't got a house here, even if he goes back to Malawi every year. If you exceed the day's present test, you become a taxpayer. Another example on it is, um, there are a lot of German people living in Cape Town. They love Cape Town. They spend half the year here. And you say to them, are you a taxpayer? He says, no, I am a German national. I don't pay tax in South Africa. Bullshit. Right. Then you have a different set of tests for corporates and trusts. If you are a South African comp registered company or trust, do not pass go, do not collect 200, you are a South African taxpayer end. But if you are a foreign company or trust, you look for the place of management or the permanent establishment. 
site office, etc. If you establish those things in South Africa, you become taxable in South Africa, even though you're not registered here. So we get this with a lot of foreign trusts where South Africans have got money abroad and they turn around and say, you can't tax that trust in South Africa. Oh, so that's very interesting. Yeah, we acknowledge that that trust is not South African registered. You've passed that test. But where is the effective place of the decisions? And they say, oh, the board of trustees all sit in an island like Guernsey. We say, no, no, let's go a little bit further. They are reacting to your emails that you are sending from South Africa. They are rubber stamping. And there's the whole trail of emails going right back to your house in Cape Town. Trust taxable in South Africa, potentially. Okay, so you can see why tax nerds get quite um, enthusiastic about it, okay? So there are all the day's present tests. Now, I'll just add another one on here, just a current affair. What have South Africans found out about this? So that we're talking about South Africans going outward. We get to the new South Africa and a lot of people lose confidence. A lot of people get early retirement, BEE, etc. Where do they go for work? All over the world. Our kids get on boats and they become part of the leisure industry. <coughs> We have South African engineers all over the world. Okay, now, we also have it in the aviation industry. It's quite interesting in that one as to who's in the aviation industry. So now, they say, well, uh, my spouse and kids are not really welcome with me there. They might give me a flat or something to stay in in Dubai or whatever. And I've still got to educate my kids, right? So we'll plonk mom in the big house in Cape Town. And we'll put the kids in the private schools and dad will have the perfect marriage. I'm only home for half the year, okay? Only home for a little bit of the year, okay? Dad's working abroad. Now you've all seen this, this happens every day. Is that person ordinarily resident in South Africa? Yes, it is the place to which he returns from his wanderings. So we then made, so we don't even need to go into all of this. He's an ordinarily resident taxpayer. The money that he earns overseas, is it taxable? Yes, except there's a let out clause. 1010 says, if you are out employed outside of the country and you are absent from South Africa, for more than 183 days a year, including one unbroken period of 60 days, then the income that you earn abroad is tax-free. Now you've all heard this thing about people earning tax-free dollars. That's how they do it. They, make, they get a foreign, con, a foreign employment, okay, you are out of South Africa for more than 183 days, including a 60-day absence. Now this was brought in in 2001 and we've just dealt with it in the Davis Tax Committee. When we brought in residence-based taxation in 2001, it was a very quick job and they said they would review that rule after three years. They never did. And so the Davis Tax Committee wrote last year, hang on, this is crazy. We've got people who enjoy all the benefits of South Africa, earning tax-free dollars, well, those that stay at home have to pay full tax. It must be reviewed, okay? And it will be reviewed this year. That was accepted in the national budget speech this year. So that rule will change. You had a question about it. Just a very quick one. Um, so if you are outside of, out of the country for those 915 days, do you then have to pay tax in the country that you take? Well, that depends which country you've gone to. And that is where the problem comes. I'll tell you, a lot of people who get fucked up with this are people who immigrate to Australia. Because the day that you get nationalized as an Australian and kiss the Aussie flag, mm -hmm. the tax inspectors are there to pick you up on the other side. And you can land up in a horrible knot with two tax officials after you. Because your citizenship rights um, have nothing to do with your tax rights. So there are a hell of a lot of South Africans 
who have, I tell you, the Aussie tax authorities are incredibly aggressive. Okay? And um, they say, well, we don't really care if you paid money tax on that in South Africa. We want tax on your worldwide income with back taxes. So some South Africans have got horribly buggered up with the rules that apply on the other side of the pond. So if I want to really ma save money, if I go to Mauritius, they say, hello, how are you? We don't really want your tax. We want you to spend money here and create employment and the tax rates are low. That's fine. But if you want to go and live in another tax jurisdiction, get outside of these rules, then you've got to consider what destination you're going to land up on. And some people just get around this by making sure that they are not in any jurisdiction <laughs> for more than 90 days a year. Right? You, you don't have a tax residence. So if you like really wealthy, okay, you say, I've got a house in the US, a house in the UK, a house in Mauritius, and a house in South Africa. And I move around the world between my various houses. So there's no categoric one that you can pin it on. Right? So nobody can tax you. The only problem is your dogs get a bit confused because every time, <laughs> you know, every time a truck stops, they think they're moving to another country. <laughs> All sorts of things. Sir Mick Jagger is resident where? France. Keith Richards. More British than that you can't get. Where does he live? I don't think he knows. No, he does know. Connecticut. <laughs> Connecticut. Okay? So, it, it, it's a massive big problem. Now, what happens is to illustrate it with the Million Dollar Golf Tournament, when you come, the golfers come here, non-resident. And in the old days, back in when Sun City was an apartheid structure, they gave them that money, that million dollars, cash tax-free. Today, if a non-resident comes here and earns that money, a withholding tax is put on them. They have to pay a 15% withholding tax to take the money away. Even on the gross. And there's enormous industry in just going back to sales and saying, no, we'd like to be assessed on it because there's a refund due, you've deducted too much withholding tax. Uh, yeah, it's all a massive game. You know, this is why people like, this is the glory side of tax, uh, you know. Yes? Uh, there are these soldiers uh, who, who go to, to Africa, but Africa is not a country. Yeah. They get their monthly salary running here, but then when they come back, they've got this lump sum mm -hmm. running down with them. So Taxable. Taxable. Okay, it could only potentially be taxable if they spent more than 183 days out. But if you're paid by the South African government, it doesn't matter, you're taxable. Okay, so that's taxable. End of story. Okay, so that's that part of it. Then the deduction formula says, what's your exempt income? What is not subject to tax? And when you look at the main categories, here are all the parties that are not taxed. Obviously the government itself. Public benefit organizations. Now please, there you see section 30. If you have anything to do with the PBO, a board's got to say there are stringent tax requirements regarding PBOs. Refer it to the risk committee or the audit committee to get some tax advice as to whether that really is a PBR. Because there's an awful amount of fraud with that. Okay? People say that they are PBRs when they are not compliant PBRs. Right? Rehabilitation companies, okay, boards or bodies. For example, South African Institute of Chartered Accountants. That is a public body. Okay? Um, and that wouldn't be taxed. A there's your big one. You see, there's your exemption. Whatever a retirement fund receives, it's tax-free. You are the beneficiary of the retirement fund. You can't be a beneficiary of an NGO. But you are the, become the beneficiary of a tax-free entity. 
That's both the income tax and the dividend tax and the capital gains tax. Now imagine how much faster your money grows if it's in a retirement fund. So let me give you a little demonstration of it. This will again be in the Fokkerfontein book. Let me show you what people did and how life's changed. Um, and this is all about change management in a way. Right. Now, your parents or your grandparents or whatever worked on the old basis of an old South African defined benefit fund, pension fund. The idea of a defined benefit pension fund, now you need to know this, it's very important in your life, in your financial plan. Pension funds start off with defined benefit. A defined benefit fund normally works on a factor of 1 over 50. For every year that you serve the fund, you get 1 50th of your closing salary as a pension. Okay? So, if you were loyal, you worked for a company for 40 years, there would be a pot equivalent to 80% of your salary when you had your pension. 40 fiftieths. Okay. And that was how we established the original retirement funds. They were all based on length of service because there was this almost irrebuttable presumption in the old days that you would work for one employer for your life. Loyalty was a big thing on a CV. Okay, you got promoted by a fluxion of time more than anything else, more than your skills. So, if you stayed from 25 to 65, you got 80% of your salary. Then, 20 years ago, the actuary said, you know what, we, that, that formula is not sustainable. Right? The funds can't grow fast enough because the pensioner body is getting, growing older and older. This was wonderful for the pension fund. You contributed for 40 years and you died within five years of retirement. No wonder the pension fund could make it. Okay? So those that lived the longest got the pot. Okay. That doesn't work anymore because everybody's living too long. Do you get that? So the defined benefit pension fund died. What funds are you or members of? A defined contribution, except if you were. Defined contribution. Very good. Unless you work for state, where you are still a member of the government employee pension fund. The Government Employee Pension Fund is a defined benefit fund. Okay? So tell me something. Why did Pravin Gordon and Ivan Pillay ever go to work at SARS in the first place? Why didn't they just become BEEs? Answer? They were given back service because they were part of the struggle. Anybody who was part of the struggle and joined the state service in the new South Africa got <coughs> given back service on the state pension pension fund. Aha, uh -huh. you see there's a reason behind everything, isn't there? Okay, so us lackeys who are in the private sector, we arrive at work and they say, we don't really, we're no longer involved about with your fund. We will give you a defined contribution provident fund. That's a provident fund. Which means, there's a fund of money there, and even if you die, you get it. And on the day that you retire, you can take the whole fucking lot. There's not an annuity doesn't have to buy you an annuity. A defined ben benefit pension fund gives you an annuity. A provident fund gives you a lump sum. 
So we said to all the employees, hey, here's something for you. If you die with a defined benefit pension fund, what do your kids get? Bye. Bugger all. That goes to the rest of the members. But if you die with a provident fund, your kids get paid out. And everybody says, I want it for my kids, okay? I really want that thing for my kids. Meanwhile, they don't realize that here, there's no risk for the employee of the capital running out. If you've got a provident fund and the capital runs out, too bad, so sad, you're dead. Okay? <laughs> Go on. So what South Africans do today is that they are members of these provident funds with no preservation requirement to them. They get to retirement, they cash in the whole provident fund, they pay a crap house full of tax on it, and then they make the most cardinal sin of financial planning. What do they do? They tell their kids they've got money. And within five years it's all gone. Because there's no um, forced preservation on it. Interestingly enough, forced preservation of provident funds was a big issue 18 months ago. Provident for Gordon tried to force it through. To say we can't have everybody skinning our pensioners alive like this. We must have forced preservation. Who stopped it? Yeah. Now surely forced preservation is the best interest of a poorer worker. Low level worker. Because we know that if we pay out that fund and somebody's no, not careful, there's going to be black tax all over the place. It's gone in a year. So shouldn't we give them an annuity rather? Why did the unions argue that? Because they know full well that their member can take that cash. Hopefully he'll buy a house or something. But if he blows it all within a year, then what happens? He gets the state pension, state gets the state grant. So you get two pensions. That's why they didn't want forced preservation. If you have forced pre preservation and you have that pension fund annuity, you can't apply for a state grant. That's why forced preservation will never happen in South Africa. Right? So now, Everybody says, you say to them, you get a tax deduction on entry into a retirement fund. You get tax-free growth in a retirement fund. Put your money into a retirement fund. And what do they all say back? Julius Malima will steal it one day. Okay. The government, the administrators will take the pot. And the counter argument to that is, that the biggest protector of the retirement fund is not the administrative, the sunlums of this world. It is the unions. The unions say, hands off, that's our money. Okay? And they, you, you've got a direct example of Gordon just trying to preserve it for everybody's good. <coughs> not a chance. Don't fiddle with the retirement funds. Now, what is the third type of retirement fund? <coughs> there are three types of retirement fund, please. The third type of retirement fund... I'm coming back there. I don't have a green. Can anybody find a green? Um, you know, just give me a green pen there. Are you hogging the greens? Okay. Um, the third type of fund is? A preservation fund. No. A retirement annuity fund. Okay, so what is a retirement annuity fund? So please, you've had defined benefit pension fund. You've had defined contribution provident fund. Most employees deal with that one. Right. A retirement annuity fund was originally made for the sole trader. 
He doesn't have an employer to contribute into a fund. He must be given a fund as well. Okay? So the retirement annuity fund is a defined benefit pension fund for the, pr for the private individual. Right. Yeah. Now wait. You can, you can, okay. So if you work for the state, there's nothing to say, I'd like to save a little bit more. I'm going to buy a an annual retirement annuity fund. And everybody used to, in the old days, if they were on one of these, you topped up with that one. Right. Now, the tax deduction to these funds is limited to 27,5% of your taxable income subject to a maximum of 350,000 rand a year contribution. Right. So I'm in the fortunate position that I can contribute 350,000 rand a year tax deductible to my retirement fund. So my, the value of my tax deduction in reducing my taxable income is therefore 45% of 350,000 rand. Somebody give me that. 350,000 times 45%. How much? 157,500 rand of tax saving a year towards my retirement. Okay. That is 10 times a pensioner grant. Mm. Right? The, pension, the social pension grant, 1300 rand a month. I am getting a state subsidy towards my retirement of 157,000 a year. What do you think of that? <coughs> and you say there's nothing in the tax system for the wealthy anymore. Right. So now, I'm now building wealth. And when we say building wealth, we say wealth has components to it. Okay? If I build wealth in my private name, what happens? I pay tax as it grows. So I've got tax in the form of CGT, income tax, dividend tax, and when I die, I've got state duty. But the retirement fund here is not only exempt from income tax, any benefit <laughs> paid by a retirement fund is estate duty free. So if I turn around and say, I build wealth in a retirement fund, I've got a tax deduction up front, an income tax exemption while it is growing, and a state duty exemption when I die. Now, why don't we explain it like that? instead of drawing pictures of people you know, like making it look like the Viagrad. <laughs> what I want to be in a position is, when I die, I've got my clothes and my house and my dog. I won't pay a state duty, I'll be below threshold. Everything else, go and visit the retirement fund administrators. Okay? And they will pay it out estate duty free. Now, there is a very there is a final reason in the story why you go that route. We've been knocking the kids all morning, or I have. Okay. Now, the kids are anticipating that when they're in their dirty thirties, they'll inherit. Dad will die. Okay. <laughs> And we'll get a pot of money and we will buy a house at the coast or pay off a divorce settlement or, or, 
you know, I'll pay back our debts or something like that, right? That's what you're expecting. But that, here's my secret. I'm not going to die. <laughs> my life expectancy has gone on. So if I live to South African life expectancy for a blue collar worker of 80, right? My daughter will be 50, 60, in her 50s, not in her 30s. And what will my daughter's biggest problem be in her 50s? She hasn't got a pension. She's underfunded on her pension. She will be approaching retirement when I die, on average. And that's all the more reason to go down the retirement fund route, because what you are bequeathing today is a pension, not a house. Different outlook on light, eh? And that's just through the reflection of time that that has happened. So the family trust that everybody's so hell-bent on building up, that's so expensive and tax inefficient, is replaced by the family retirement fund that is passed down from generation to generation, where you are the beneficiaries of that fund. You just fill out an election form. And all the money that's there, you can send it where it wants, and you can, change your, you can change your mind on it whenever you want as well, as to who you're going to give it to. So if you have a blowout with your daughter, you can say, scratch. <laughs> okay. And I can continue contributing into these funds. There's no age limit on a retirement annuity fund. So if I've got a tax problem and I'm in my 90s, I just put more money into the retirement annuity fund and I reduce my tax. Even though I know I'm never going to draw it down as a pension. It's a bequest through a retirement fund. You see why that, that, that principle is so important? Because of that exemption that you get under 101D. That is the, the most important tax exemption in the Tax Act. Okay? Dividends are exempt. Why are they exempt? Because they have dividend withholding tax put on them, which becomes a final tax with individuals. So you've paid 15% at source. The way the dividend tax system works um, in South Africa, just in its essence, sorry, we're going slowly now, but I've got to explain this. Dividend tax is imposed in South Africa it was brought in at 15% in 2012. Okay. And it's a tax on the individual. Because when a dividend is paid from a company to another company, or from a company to a pension fund, there is no dividend tax. It's exempt. And there's no withholding tax either. But when it is paid to an individual, 15%. In this year, they increased that to 20%. It is deducted at source. 20% deduction of withholding tax, but because it is exempt in terms of Section 101K, you can't claim the withholding tax back, so you've got an inherent 20% tax rate on your dividends. Okay, so that, that's that your two important exemptions in this thing are the retirement fund exemption and the dividend tax exemption. Okay? Now, so there are your exemptions. Now, then comes the deductions. And the deductions, you start off with the first category of deductions, which are section 11 read with section 18 read with section 23 of the Act. And people, you can make a mishmash of this, okay? It says, for the purposes of carrying on trade, there shall be deductions of expenditure and losses actually incurred in the production of income, provided such expenditure and losses are not of a capital nature. That's your stock. That's your wages. You read that as being so long as the expenditure doesn't give you a business benefit of more than one year, a tangible business benefit of more than one year, then that expense is deductible. Actually incurred in the production of the income. 
So that is a genuine business expense. Okay? But, no then it says that's the first provisio. The second provisio, notice you dump into section 23. That's the first hurdle. Second hurdle is section 23. And it says, there may be no deduction in respect of the cost of the maintenance of the taxpayer, his family, or his establishment. So, right. I'm so busy, I can't pay attention. Right? I've got to hire somebody to walk my dogs. I'd like to do it myself, but I'm too busy. Is that expenditure actually incurred in the production of income? Yes, it is. Is it deductible? No. Same applies to things like au pairs and very importantly your clothes. Okay? Clothes, hairdos, um, all of that stuff are prohibited from deduction in terms of item A. Now I look at that and I think, go back to the example today where we're saying Hang on, let's make our staff's life a little bit easier. Okay? How much of your salary do you spend on the clothes that get to work? Just the clothes to go to work. Suits. Shirts. I often think of this in the context of the misery it must be to be a member of parliament. Where you earn a million, you take home after tax 500,000, and you've got to spend 10,000 rand a month just looking good out of after-tax money. No wonder you need bailouts from time to time. It's expensive to be a parliamentarian and it's not deductible. Right, you can't claim that. Well, <laughs> ah, who said that? That was very good. On the other hand, if I am the employer and I turn around and I say, hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm going to say to my employees, I'm going to get one of these image consultants in. And they're going to give us a standard company dress. Yeah. Like the people in the OK Bazaars and um, Checkers and these places. Everybody comes to school in a uniform. I'll pay for it. Now, that looks as being a business decision on company image. We don't want everybody looking like a trap. Okay? You can't extend that with, Matthew, you always look like you just came out of a paper packet. Our business is going to buy you a suit. Okay, it's got to be a uniform. But we can get some pretty classy uniforms going. If your company provides you with a uniform, tax free. Now, all of this makes a contribution. I'm giving you a cell phone, I'm giving you a uniform, I'm giving you lunch in the company canteen, tax-free fringe benefit. <coughs> I'm giving you a clinic. Okay, I'm taking, own, I'm giving you bursaries for your kids. Okay, what am I doing? I'm taking ownership of the employee. Or I'm, help, I'm taking responsibility for my employees. Who is the biggest stakeholder in my book? Sika. Aren't we going a bit backwards in terms of what was happening in the 90s and the 70s whereby they were externalizing their costs and giving it to their employees individually, their companies. And now you're proposing that companies should internalize those costs. I'm and saying, yeah. Those. I'm not saying we're going backwards. I'm saying we were doing it right in the 70s. Okay. okay. <clears throat> we got all too clever. We persuaded everybody to come off the pension fund and go to the provident fund. We told everybody to come off the car and go to the, company, to the travel allowance, right? So the company car system stopped. We said medical aid's your own problem, but you can save money if you take the lower versions. Just phone Discovery Health, <coughs> right? Your life insurance is your own problem. Okay, keep on doing all of this. What are we saying? Actually, 30 years ago, an employee's job was to work. The employer looked after the employee. In the cost to company scenario that we came to then afterwards, we forced everybody to take responsibility for themselves. 
which for middle and lower level workers is irresponsible. They don't understand all this shit. So you've got to say, hang on, why didn't I provide all of this stuff for you? Right. Now, if we go back to what should you be doing about your pension fund, what fund do you guys want? You're going to, we've said, change career. You want to be mobile. What's the most mobile retirement fund? A retirement annuity fund. Doesn't matter who you're working for, you take responsibility for your own contributions and your own funding. Your employer's job is to pay you. That's it, as far as your retirement fund is concerned. And again, you've got to watch this also when it comes to the other aspect, which is not only your retirement, but your group life and disability. On your group life and disability, everybody said that that is cheaper if it is provided by the employer. They've got the economies of scale. Right. But you people are MBAs. Actuaries look at MBAs and they say, that's just the client we're looking for. They are responsible people. So then you get the tailor-made structured product today that used to, it was actually designed by the CAs years ago to look after themselves. Okay. And what that product does is it is priced according to your risk profile, not the risk profile of South Africa. So, for example, a funeral policy bought off, um, off the TV, a rand a day. It always sees that rand a day. 30 rand a month. You could probably get that for about five or six. If you get the professional product. Okay. For the same money, you would get him over a million rands with a disability cover. But what you've got to do is you've got to say, right, I've got to get the right product for the right person at the right price. And that is one of the biggest reasons to become a graduate. All your products in for the financial services market become cheaper. They don't do a very good job of selling that. Um, you know, there are things about it. Um, I, I've got disability insurance, I've had it all my life, since I left university. When I retire, I will get about five million pay out from my disability cover, because I never claimed. So an insurance bonus is nothing new. We've been doing it in life insurance for years. I get a statement every year, premium paid 50,000. Growth in value of your portfolio, 200,000. So I'm on free disability insurance as we stand now. Until, I'm, until I can carry on doing it until I'm 70. Because you got in young enough. Okay? Um, you must get somebody to explain that to you. It's important. Right. Um, no deductions on the cost of your establishment. Right? No deduction on your house. Obviously, that's your biggest expense. They're not going to give you a tax deduction. Unless you're trading from it. Okay? So now you've got to do a measurement. Okay? And you've got to say, how much of the house is used for business? So did you see that little shack on the video this morning called Focal Fontaine? I've just bought that. That's my office. I can buy an office. You can't if you're an employee. That's a tax deductible office. 20 meters from the sea. Why? That's all I do. I live in Kenton and I work there. I don't have an office at Rhodes. The business is not used for anything else. I claim a tax deduction. But I've got to be careful. Okay? So. C, any loss you can recover off an insurance company. Not deductible. These are any penalty or fine that you've paid in a business is not tax deductible. Even if it was a speeding fine to get to a client faster. You can't claim it. Okay? 
expenditure to produce income that wasn't taxable. And then this is the one that causes all the fun. Any amount that was not wholly or exclusively laid out for purposes of trade. That is the second test from 11a. Remember 11a said expenditure actually incurred in the production of income may be deductible. This one puts it another way. Any money is claimed as a deduction to the extent that they were laid out for purposes of trade. Now this, this has got a very strange interpretation. It's been through the courts here. It allows them to look at your motive. And it, it, it's a very, a very, and Charles doesn't always get this right. So, they, can they come along to me and say, the operating expenses on that house that I claim as a deduction, you can't claim that, that's a whole house that you are using for an office. What's my counter-argument? You can't interfere with my business decisions. I need a big boardroom. I'm a big guy. Okay? They can't do anything about it. If I start using it as a holiday home, mm -hmm. I've let another expenditure into it. Okay? Then it's got to be apportioned. Alright? So I've got to be careful. The lead case on this is the British case of Malaloo versus Drummond, which is quite fun. A lady advocate in the UK, or what you call a barrister in the UK, you know all the garb that they wear when they go to court, wigs and fuck knows what else, right? She tried to claim that as a tax deduction. She said, I wouldn't have bought it except for trade. Okay? I don't even like it. I look like an idiot in it. I could only have bought it for trade. And the court found, she, they said, no, Mom, we, we, we acknowledge that. But it was incurred so that you were warm and decently clad during the part of the day that you were at work. There's a subconscious motive. Goodbye. And that was adopted in South Africa in the white safari suit case. The doctors used to buy those white safari suits. Remember that? And try and claim that? No. You've got to be warm and decent declared. That's a private expense. Okay? And overall might be a different thing. Okay? Or protective clothing might be a different thing. Okay? And the last one on this, just to drive the point home, is our hero from yesterday, Raymond Ackerman. Okay? <laughs> He was taken to court on this. Um, as we heard yesterday, he's a philanthropist. Okay, he likes to give out the image of a philanthropist. So he, Pick and Pay, made a massive um, donation to the Urban Foundation and claimed it as a tax deduction. And so I said, no, that's philanthropy. That's not business, that's charity. Can't deduct it. Uh, Ackerman takes them all the way to Bloemfontein, right? And he says, as Ackerman would, you know, he talks about four legs of a table. When, it, when he talks about tax, he talks about two hats. He says, when I was on the board of the Urban Foundation, I had my philanthropist's hat on. We would like to have some money for Cape Town. When I was on the board of Pick and Pay, I was wearing a different hat. The hat that it would look good for business. And the SCA said, stuff you, you don't change your mind by changing your hat. <laughs> okay? No deduction. There was an ulterior motive in what you are doing. No tax deduction. Okay? So that was Ackerman's not too successful attempt at um, tax in the SCA. Not one of his um, less published accomplishments. Um, anyway. So, that is involving Section 23G. That's an important one. Okay. Um, restraint of trade payments. Not deductible. Or written off over the period. Okay. Um, now, this one comes up. Prevention and of combating of corrupt activities. Any payment towards a corrupt activity is not deductible. Even if it produces income. 
And this has been a big thing in South African companies dealing in Nigeria. They have penguin salutes there all over the place to get business, right? And um, that expenditure when it's brought back to South Africa is not deductible. Because in terms of our law, not Nigeria's law, that is a illegal action. Right, so don't, no such thing as a tax deductible bribe to a traffic cop, okay? <laughs> Fines, not deductible. And then we have a load of tests that go further, that deal with specific types of expenditure. There's one for legal fees, there's one for repairs, etc. Now, I, you don't have to know that. What you have to know is that that nerd that you are um, controlling from the board has got a whole load of legislation behind him that he's got to know and it all fits in boxes and it's not the same rule as accounting rules okay you can keep it as what is gross income what is exempt and what is the general rule for a deduction you don't have to know all of these specific silly ones down the bottom. The nerds will deal with that. Okay. Five minute break or ten minute break.